Hello, my sweet summer children. I'm back with the juice to get you through the long night. I cannot begin to explain how good the first episode of House of the Dragon was. I watched it three times because I was like, you know what? My sweet summer children have been really patient with me. They've been waiting for me. So I'm going to give them the most detailed breakdown I could possibly give you. That's what I'm going to do because... Did Viserys really say that at the end of the episode? Like, did we really get that moment, the A Song of Ice and Fire? Oh, my God. I'm so excited. I need to stay focused. I need to stay focused. When Viserys was like, promise me, Rhaenyra, I got madly on a Stark vibes. I started crying. My eyelash was hanging off. But let's get into it. So I'm going to tell you that that quote, like I'm going to start off right here, that that quote was from George. And I'm going to talk about it at the end of this video. But before I get into the juice, I want to let y'all know I'll be streaming every Monday at 830 Eastern Standard Time with my Direwolf City gang on the new Direwolf City channel that will be linked below. Also, before before we get into it before we get into it let me know in the comments who your favorite character is i'm dying to know which character if any which is the one that wh what's the one you fell in love with what's the one that you was like just jumped out to you also i'm gonna say this in this video the Corliss valerian haters please do not say shit on my channel don't say shit on my channel like don't don't come for me don't talk to me this is not a safe space for you i will drag you and feed you to my children also, I'm going to try to do this video with no spoilers or as minimal spoilers as possible. I'll have spoiler videos that will be titled as spoilers in the title. So you're safe with me, babe. I got you. I got you. So House of the Dragon opens up with Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen giving exposition on the Great Council of 101. The Great Council of 101 took place at Harrenhal and the shots of Harrenhal are just amazing. Harrenhal is the most massive castle in the Seven Kingdoms and we finally get to see just how big it is with people inside it. Like, Harrenhal is fucking huge. It has, like, one hall with a hundred fireplaces in it. Anyway, in Game of Thrones, we do see Harrenhal multiple times, but we never get to see it like this. It just feels, like, so, I don't know, it just feels massive. So it was decided by all the great lords of Westeros at this great council that the male claim must come before the female claim. Viserys would be king. As Rhaenyra is narrating the exposition, she says Jaehaerys called this council because he knew the only thing that could tear down the House of the Dragon was itself. And that's so fucking true. And that's what we are watching unfold. The fall of House Targaryen. Anyway... After the cold open, we get shots of Rhaenyra Targaryen riding through the skies of King's Landing on the back of Cyrax, her dragon. Cyrax looks amazing, and her face shape is way different than what we have seen before with the Drogon, Rhaegal, Viserion, even Caraxes. I like that the dragons look different. You could tell them apart when you look at them. Rhaenyra lands with Cyrax at the Dragon Pit. The ruins of the Dragon Pit is where Daenerys finally came face to face with Cersei in Season 7 of Game of Thrones. King's Landing has three big hills, the Hill of Rainies, Visenya's Hill, and Aegon's High Hill. The Red Keep is on Aegon's High Hill. The Great Sept of Baelor, the one that Cersei blew up, was on Visenya's Hill. But the Sept of Baelor has not yet been built during this time period. However, on the Hill of Rainies is the Dragon Pit. Also, it looks like the tourney grounds are outside of the Dragon Pit. So, it is believed by most people that the Dragon Pit is what caused the Targaryen dragons to not grow as big as they did in Valyria. And it rings true because no Targaryen dragon ever grew as big as Valyrian the Black Dread. If we look at Cyrax, when she lands, it seems as though she doesn't really want to go into the pit. Like, she doesn't want to go. It's, it almost looks like crate and a dog. Like, when I tell Kato to get in his crate, she looked like that when the Dragon Keepers were telling her to get in there. Anyway, there are two Dragon Keepers there. There's more than two, but two at the front one looks like an og one looks like he's training and he's about to piss his pants the order of the dragon keepers was founded after Arya targaryen stole Balerion the black dread and ran off to valyria with him and came back with fireworms with faces coming out of her coochie 
ew. Anyway, these dragon keepers on the show speak Valyrian. So the dragons themselves seem to only understand Valyrian, which is why all the commands that are given to the dragons are in Valyrian. The dragons do indeed seem to be friendlier to people with the blood of old Valyria. We've seen many examples of this, but we do have an example of this with Daenerys, like with Brown Ben Plum. Danny's dragons in a Game of Thrones really like him or in the books, because I don't think Brown Ben is in the show. Anyway... Brown Ben does have Valyrian blood. Either way, it is said in the text that no one knows the dragons better than the dragon keepers. But honey, the dragon flying, Daenerys theme music mixed in there, it had me fucking crying. Like this whole episode had me crying. Like my eyelash, I said my eyelash was hanging off. Anyway, so we meet Harold Westerling, the captain of the Kingsguard, and he's there to escort Rhaenyra back to the Red Keep. But also we have young Alicent Hightower who's there to greet Rhaenyra as well. And can we just acknowledge how sick Rhaenyra's riding coat is? The dragon scales on the shoulder. I don't know, Danny would just be proud. Danny, cousin Danny would be proud, boo. So seeing King's Landing in its heyday was just, it, it was chef's kiss. Mwah, 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 chef's kiss. Seeing some of the spots like this one, this is where Cersei had the map painted on the floor. Alicent and Rhaenyra, they seem to be besties. Now, this is a book change, kind of, because Allison is actually much older than Rhaenyra. However, I like the change because it gives us insight into who Allison is and how she was used by her father. Yes, I'm team black all day, but I'm not going to sit up here and act like women aren't used as their father's pawns in this story. Speaking of being used, Ama Aaron. I loved Ama Aaron, and I'm going to talk about what happened to her because absolutely not, absolutely fucking not, we're going to talk about it, but I'm not going to talk about it till we get to that part. So Rhaenyra goes to see her mother who is pregnant, really pregnant and miserable. We get to see the relationship between Rhaenyra and her mother and it's so sweet. It's so sweet. It's really like, a, I really loved it. Rhaenyra is like all these people around you they only care about the baby and not you which prompts Ama to talk about Rhaenyra about the woman's role like she talks to Rhaenyra about the woman's role in Westeros we fight our battles in the birthing bed which for this time period I guess it's true um it's law that women can't inherit over men and their duty is kind of just birth sons and shut the fuck up if you look at England in the Tudor reign Henry VIII to be more exact the whore king of England he went through mad wives to get a son and Jane Seymour the woman who finally gave him a son died in the birth and bed and we gonna talk about it all in a minute but I want to go in the order of things because I get sidetracked easy honey I get sidetracked if you're not following me on Twitter you should because I pop mad shit over there anyway after Rhaenyra leaves her mother she joins her father's small council to be his cupbearer she is to pour wine and listen and learn the king's cupbearer is an honored title unless you're the cupbearer for Bobby be <laughs> poor Lancel. Anyway, Ama and Viserys both tell Renera that she smells of dragon. Kind of like, I guess, like you can smell a horse if you ride a horse. I'm guessing dragons smell like brimstone, ashes. I, I don't know. Like, does fire come out of a dragon's booty hole when he fart? Uh, like, does it smell like, oh, it probably smells like the smell when you're pumping gas or some shit. I don't know. See, I told y'all, I told y'all I get sidetracked. Anyway, I like the actor that plays Viserys. I feel like he really sells the role. Also, Matt Smith as Damon. Oh my God. Uh, but when we first meet Viserys, I'm like, yes, that's book accurate. Viserys, he's like laughing and he's eating. He's not really taking anything serious. And, and Viserys was like that. Like he was a jolly man, like Santa. And Corliss is just like, I don't have time for none of this shit. Like he, he doesn't want the laughing. Like he's ready to get to business. Corliss Valerian, he, he's no nonsense. No nonsense, Corliss Valerian, Big Daddy, Triple OG, Double C, Snake. Corliss Valerian is the Lord of Driftmark, head of House Valerian. The Valerians are from Old Valyria, and they came to Westeros before the Targaryens. Valerians didn't come to Westeros with dragons. The Valerians don't ride dragons. Their power is in their ships. However, the Valerians that do ride dragons, Lena and Lanor, 
are half Targaryen, children of Princess Rhaenys. So, Corlys is expressing his concern about the triarchy to the king's council. So let's talk about it because there will be fire and blood before it's all said and done. In the narrow sea off the banks of Essos, there's an area called the Disputed Lands. The free cities of Myr, Lys, and Tyrosh formed an alliance called the Triarchy, or the Three Whores. Anyway, the alliance was formed to clear out the pirates in the tiny islands called the Stepstones. These islands were once a part of the Arm of Dorne before the Hammer of the Waters or breaking the Arm of Dorne. Anyway, King Viserys and the council at first were cool with this, like less pirates means safer trade routes. But the HBIC, Craggish Draha or the Crab Feeder, got greedy. He became sort of like a pirate, like himself, like they just became what they were trying to get rid of so to clear out like the stepstones they staked pirates at the beach and let the tide come in on them so like they would drown kind of what theon said the ironborn did to foes but after they cleared out the pirates they started to enslave people they even captured and sold highborn girls to pillow houses they started charging steep trade tolls to go through the stepstones and all of this is a problem for corliss valerion whose wealth is built on trade and his ships both his children are dragon riders and it would be a problem for the triarchy if the dragons come to play anyway the king's council is made up of corliss valerion master of ships lord lyman beesbury master of coin lord lionel strong as Ma master of laws maester melos and sir otto hightower hand of the king so daemon targaryen also has a seat on the council he is commander of the city watch Lord Beesbury is talking about how the crown financed Damon's makeover of the City Watch. So before Damon became their commander, they were a ragamuffin goof troop of clowns with mixed matched armor, dull swords, just like bullshit. Like you wouldn't want them to defend your city. Damon is the one that cloaked them in gold and got them all the way together. So Corliss wants to talk about... The very real threat to trade in Westeros, the Triarchy and their leader, the Crab Feeder. But Sir Otto wants to talk about the tourney, the heir's tourney. This you, this is so some subtle shit, but you got to watch motherfuckers around you that are like Sir Otto. It pleases the king to talk about his heir's tourney. So Sir Otto switches the subject to that because it's pleasing for the king, even though what Corliss is talking about is way more important. So it goes to show you very subtly very early on that maybe Damon has a point about Sir Otto. At the council, it's also discussed that the maesters have currently predicted the day or the week that Queen Aima will give birth, and Viserys has planned a tourney for this week of his birth. So Damon is in King's Landing, no one knows, um, and Rhaenyra is excited to see him. So Rhaenyra and Damon have a very close relationship in the books. He always brings her gifts when he returns from these exotic locations. So Rhaenyra meets him in secret in the throne room. Ah. I wonder, like, I wonder what Ned Stark would have thought of Daemon Targaryen. Like, what would a Ned Stark say to Daemon sitting his ass in that Iron Throne? <laughs> it's actually treason, but it's Daemon, so who cares? The whole scene of them speaking to each other in Valyrian and Daemon giving her the Valyrian steel necklace, it's just a great scene, and it shows you how close they are when Rhaenyra was young. The next scene is a weirwood tree in King's Landing and Rhaenyra and Alicent sitting under it doing their little studies. It's so cute. I feel like, I'm just going to say this, I feel like it's super true. If people don't question your sexuality when they see you and your friends together, then you are they even your friends? Are they even your friends? Because I know, like, I'm straight, but people all think that me and my friends are gay for each other. Anyway. Then we have a scene with Viserys with a sore on his back and we later see him cut his hand on the Iron Throne. Legend says when the Iron Throne cuts you, it's denying you. It says you don't belong here, my guy. No, you don't. Anyway, from this scene, it cuts to Viserys and Queen Aima. She's in a tub and she's miserable. They talk about Rhaenyra and Rhaenyra picking out a dragon's egg for her sister that she would name Visenya, which is... Okay, so I'm not going to say that because that is kind of a spoiler, but if you read Fire and Blood, just connect the dots. But hearing Ama apologize because she couldn't give Viserys an heir just did something to my soul, especially when we see how things end for her. So Viserys then describes this dream that he had, placing his son on the Iron Throne and his son being born with a crown. 
dreams in this universe are not just dreams they are guides they are warnings they are also not to be trusted as you see them and they never happen exactly as they appear this dream will come to pass but not how Viserys interpreted it and this dream could have been the work of something way larger at play something that wanted to bring down House Targaryen anyway Next, we get a good look at Damon and his gold cloaks. They are rounding up the bad guys at King's Landing. If you're a raper, they're cutting your balls off. If you're a thief, they're cutting your hands off. And the head, if you're a murderer, beheaded. You're gone. This atrocity is followed by a council meeting. And this council meeting was one of my favorite parts just because Damon absolutely reads Sir Otto to filth. Sir Otto is pissed at Damon's brutality, but Damon has a point. Knights and lords from all over, people in general from all over on their way to King's Landing, so get the bad guys out of the way. Like, let, like, okay, let's compare Damon to Janice Slint. In a Game of Thrones, when Robert has the turning of the hand for Ned Stark, this is the type of shit that's going down under the watch of Janice Slint. This is a quote from the books. Knights have been arriving from all over the realm, and for every knight we get two free riders, three craftsmen, six men at arm, a dozen merchants, two dozen whores, and more thieves than I dare guess. This cursed heat had half the city in a fever to start, and now with all these visitors last night, we had a drowning, a tavern riot, three knife fights, a rape, two fires, robberies beyond count, and a drunken horse race down the street of the sisters. The night before, a woman's head was found in the great sept, floating in the rainbow pool. No one seems to know how it got there or who it belongs to. So yeah, Janice Slint, you weren't fucking doing your job. Damon said not on my fucking watch, bet that. So yeah, I think Damon has a point. And Damon was like, you might know this if your bitch ass ever left the safety of the castle, ho. Yeah, you might know, but you don't. I, I really just don't like Sir Otto, so I'm going to read him to filth every time. Anyway, Viserys agrees with Damon, and so does Lord Corliss. But Otto don't like Damon, so Otto has to bring up how Damon does not fulfill his husband duties. And Damon completely fucking owns him. Oh, you so worried about Lady Raina, my bronze bitch? Well, I'll give her to you. Didn't your wife die or some shit? <laughs> like, woo, 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 the sass. And what would King's Landing be without the pleasure houses? So we see Damon is tearing Masaria's ass up, but he can't focus because he really wants his brother's trust and approval and it's a lot of shit going on and he's sad because maybe he wants to be the heir, but maybe he doesn't. Next, there is the tourney and it's completely magnificent. Um, I've never seen any shit like this on TV ever, like at, on this scale. We get our first look at Corliss and Rainey's children, Elena and Lenore, the twins. They are so fucking cute. And who is this Dornish man that's handing out ass whoopings? Oh, it's Christian Cole, the demon of Dorn. Then we have Lord Baratheon asking for the favor of Rainey's, the queen who never was, Rainey's, Rainey's mother is Jocelyn Baratheon. That's why she calls him cousin also the wreath of blue roses is very much liana vibes the promise me rainera also liana vibes we're gonna talk about that when we get there anyway prince damon arrives and chooses his first opponent and of course it's sir it's sir otto's son a slight to sir otto anyway damon asks for allison's favor another slight to sir otto but i wonder like i truly wonder <laughs> if he if he is or if he already has pop that cherry in spite of Sir Otto. So the tourney is intercut with Ama giving birth. Her baby is breech. She's in pain. It's awful. Uh, it was a, as a woman, that shit was hard to watch. The tourney is turning deadly and so is birthing this baby. So Maester Melos brings up the idea of a cesarean. So let's talk about it. Then I'll go back to the tourney. This scene really made me hate Viserys. It really made me hate him. They brutally cut that baby from her belly, knowing it would kill her as she fought them to stop them from doing it. It was awful to watch. I hated it. But I think it was necessary. And I do think it's par for the fucking course for medieval times. Fuck that. It's par for the course right now that a woman has no say over her own fucking body. So childbirth 
during that time period that like a song of ice and fire is based on the medieval times childbirth during that time was how ama described it it was their battlefield childbirth even in 2022 people die people die from childbirth one of my really good friends had preeclampsia and they literally like emergency cut her baby from her stomach she doesn't have like this neat little horizontal pelvic scar she has some jigsaw looking vertical scar on her abdomen that she calls talking tracy hey nicole anyway that was now so imagine then so I decided to do a service to you guys and I spent some time looking at medical essays on Henry VIII's third wife, Jane Seymour. So the National Library of Medicine has some info on this kind of stuff, but it's believed that she died from complications due to a cesarean. Jane died 12 days after the birth of her son, the son Henry VIII wanted so badly. So some people speculate it wasn't a cesarean. Other people believe it was, and she actually died from a complication of this cesarean but these researchers believe she died from peritonitis after a cesarean section which was performed for political reasons they also believe that if her body was exhumed today there would be physical evidence of this abdominal surgery anyway medieval birthing techniques were insane and it's believed like the name cesarean itself comes from julius caesar at the time, the procedure was performed only when the mother was dead or dying as an attempt to save the child for a state wishing to increase its population. Roman law under Caesar decreed that all women who were so fated by childbirth must be cut open, hence cesarean. I'm just gonna like just link the article below because I think it's chock full of good info if you're interested. But I will just say, do you see where this show is going? Do you see where this show is going? Women mean nothing. Sit down, shut up, take this dick and have this baby. You shall not inherit shit. Neither will your daughters. This is what Rhaenyra sees. This is what Rhaenyra hears. This is what is drilled into Rhaenyra. So yeah, I'm team black all the way. I'm with Rhaenyra when Rhaenyra's like, I'll be damned if I give up my claim to shit. These days are over. Also, this scene or scene like this does happen in Fire and Blood. Jaehaerys's mother, Alyssa Valerion. Alyssa Valerion is married to Rogar Baratheon. She's in her 40s. She goes into labor. Jaehaerys and Queen Alysanne are there. And so is Rogar. They say nothing can be done to save Alyssa, but they might be able to save the baby. Rogar says, save my son. The baby wasn't a son, though. It was Lady Jocelyn Baratheon, Princess Rhaenys' mother. There are two accounts of this birth. One is that Alysanne and Jaehaerys was there with their mother, and she gave them consent to save the baby. The other account is much like what we saw happen to Ama. Well, not really, because it's just no consent was given because she never woke up. Either way, both accounts say that, you know, Alysanne was there holding her mother's hand through the whole thing. Ama got none of that. I also got mad Raina vibes from Rhaenyra. Her blood is on your hands. Her blood is on your cock. Save my wife, you should have said. But what are wives to men like you? And Raina basically threatens Lord Rogar if he ever marries again, that she'll turn Storm's End into Hall Part 2. And Rogar never married again. <laughs> I love Raina Targaryen, but I'm getting these vibes from Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra is angry with her father, just like Raina was with Rogar. So the thought that he might remarry after this, that Viserys might remarry after this, how the fuck is Rhaenyra supposed to feel about that? How is she supposed to feel about it? And I remember a lot of people saying they didn't think that HBO was going to do blood and cheese. Do you still think that? After last night's episode, do you still think that? Because if you do, you can't think that anymore. Yes. It was an awful scene. A woman having no say over her body. But with Roe v. Wade being overturned in 2022, par for the fucking course. Par for the fucking course. And sure, Viserys is upset. He's mourning. He said, boo fucking who? Fuck Viserys. Anyway, Christian Cole knocks Damon into the lane divider and his armor grinds down that shit like he's Tony fucking hawk this turns into a melee and damon's arrogance causes him to take the l ama dies but so did the baby rainer is angry she said she's depressed she's lost her mother 
She gives command for Cyrax to light the funeral pyre. Traditional Targaryen burial is cremation, but I'm sure Viserys wanted all the evidence of what he did up in that room burned anyway. Then we have a council meeting. And Sir Otto is crying about Damon as usual. What's fucking new? They are convincing Viserys to name a successor, and he doesn't want to hear it. Lord Strong is the only one that speaks against naming Rhaenyra. Viserys ain't trying to hear none of that shit. Oh, but Sir Otto has a trick up his sleeve. We see Alicent being directed by her father to basically go fuck the king. This is how women were used. This is how women were used in Westeros. Go fuck him, girl. Go fuck him. He's the Tom Bolin of Westeros. I hate him. She goes to see him. She's nervous and filled with anxiety, so much so that she's biting the skin from her nails, but yet she must obey her father. So she shows up in her mother's dress to comfort the king with a book. It is known that she used to read books to the old king. Mushrooms, but Mushroom says that's not all she was doing. She was doing more than reading to the old king. We then flash to Damon in the pleasure houses, drunk as hell, about to give a speech, but we don't see exactly what he says. So Sir Otto runs back to use this as fuel for Viserys to be angry and name Rhaenyra his heir, which would disinherit Damon. Damon never admits that he says it, though. He simply says, people mourn in their own way. I have always, if you watch my Damon video from years ago, it's a complete character breakdown on Damon. I'll link it for you guys so you can watch it. I always thought Otto made it up. I always thought Otto embellished the story to piss off Viserys to give him fuel to disinherit Damon. So when Damon comes into the throne room, a war of words is happening. These brothers, they love each other. I don't care what you think or what you feel. These two love each other. Damon would indeed protect Viserys. Damon was gathering. Damon was the one gathering swords in the Riverlands to fight for Viserys' claim to the throne. Should they overlook him at the Great Council of 101? Damon tells Viserys like it is. Viserys is a weak king. He's a people pleaser and wants to please everyone. He hates discourse, and those people, they don't make good kings. Sir Otto has manipulated everything to have his daughter next in line to get railed by the king. Viserys tells Damon that he's naming Rhaenyra his heir, and he tells him to pack his shit and head to the Vale. Then we get my favorite scene of the entire episode. Rhaenyra and Viserys at Balerion Skull. They speak about the power of dragons, a power men should have never trifled with. He tells her she is his heir, and it's intercut with the great lord swearing her fealty and Rhaenyra getting dressed in her queenly garb to be named Princess of Dragonstone. This scene is also intercut with Damon leaving. He is in the dragon pit with Caraxes, and Damon letting Masaria pet Caraxes. It's almost like a dude with a Lamborghini. It's almost like a dude with a Lamborghini or some shit like, hey, boo, you want to ride in my car? This is intercut with prophecy. The prophecy of a song of ice and fire. I lost my shit, y'all. I lost it. The Sarah says that Aegon had a dream. Aegon foresaw the end of the world of men. It is to begin with a terrible winter gusting out of the distant north. This is intercut with Rickard Stark swearing fealty to Rhaenyra. Viserys says Aegon saw absolute darkness riding on those winds. Whatever dwells within will destroy the world of the living. When this great winter comes, all of Westeros must stand against it. And if the world of men is to survive, a Targaryen must be seated on the Iron Throne. A king or a queen strong enough to unite the realm against the cold. Aegon called his dream a song of ice and fire. When Viserys says this, he grabs the dagger, the cat's ball dagger, the dagger that Arya killed the Night King with. And he says this secret has been passed from king to heir since Aegon's time. So this connects a lot of dots. And this prophecy or the idea that this prophecy existed, this was the reason that Aegon conquered Westeros. This idea, this whole thing is from George R. R. Martin. He implied it three to four years ago. I did a video on it then and I will link it below. But he basically admitted to this this is from george so the dagger itself i think is related the dagger belonged to robert 
before Joffrey gave it to the cat's ball to kill Bran. Robert likely took it off the Mad King body Robert likely took it off the Mad King's body this is why King Torn Stark bent the knee to Aegon because Aegon told him what he was doing or because Torn already knew this also echoes why John bent the knee to Danny this also explains why everyone was so oblivious to what's going on because the people that knew the secret were killed Ares and Rhaegar, king and heir, were both killed in Robert's rebellion and their secret died with them. When he says, when Viserys says, promise me this, Rhaenyra, it takes me all the way back to the Tower of Joy. And episode one ends with Damon flying off on the incredible looking beast, the Red Worm, Caraxes. Caraxes is like the best looking dragon so far. Anyway, Viserys also names Rhaenyra, Princess of Dragonstone and heir to the Iron Throne. And y'all, if this episode is any indication of what HBO, Ryan Condo, Miguel Spotnik, and George Martin have in store for us, House of the Dragon will be bigger than Game of Thrones. It will be bigger than Game of Thrones. We ain't never leaving Westeros, y'all. But what do y'all think? And don't forget to come hang out with us tonight dire wolf city every monday at 8 30 p.m eastern standard time as always thanks for watching thanks to everyone who supports me on patreon if you like this video please give it a thumbs up please click the subscribe button hit that notification bell and join the sweet summer family okay my sweet summer children have a good day